Welcome, everybody. Thank you for checking out this episode of Really Dicey. Today, we're going to talk about ancestry and culture, an alternative to race in 5e by Arcanist Press, uh, written by Eugene Marshall. What this book does is that it takes away the idea of race in d and There is a phrase here, and I'm going to try to find it because it, it um, says it very well um, about how how we are all different species, but not different races. Uh, ra- there, there is technically no real difference of race. Uh, there is a difference of species. And um, I am not scientifically enabled enough to like talk about that in length, but, the, but realistically, we are all, in D&D at least, everyone and real life, but like in D&D, we are all humanoid creatures of some sort. Um, and there are expectations kind of similar to historical expectations put on races, different races um, that should not exist and don't need to exist. And this book clarifies through, like, if you read through the um, why race matters in fantasy section that they have, which is very well written with great examples, um, they explain why instead of just having an overarching racial feature, say, well, as they use orc, for example, instead of them always being rough brutish, strong, um, aggressive, uh, those things can be broken down into one, more neutral terms instead of just negative terms, um, and two, be broken down into stuff that's based on ancestry, the parents who birthed you, and the genetics, and culture, what you grew up around and grew up near, and where and what you learned. Well, I like about this book, that it answers a question I've had for a long time. So we have half-elves, we have half orcs. Why aren't there gnome dragonborn or other variations? Why is it stuck to this? And I, I've had players who say, what if we do this? What if we do that? So we, a lot of times I have to like homebrew uh, a new creation um, a, a lot. Um, so with this, it, it, it takes away the, the racial features that 5e has and, or d d has in general. And instead it breaks it down to ancestral and cultural traits and what, what's great about that is, is one, you can, you can be at, or you can have orc and elvish uh, ancestry. Uh, and you can, you can kind of pick around the culture of each um, of ancestry and, and, and pick and choose what you want for your character. Very, very interesting way of customizing your character. It's like, it gives you almost like a balanced ways of, of, of creating a, a character that, that you want to make. Um, uh, also, it, it answers also another question that like I've seen this a lot in fantasy where let's say uh, a human is raised in uh, a dwarf society and there are just as, um, uh, because uh, growing up there, they've just become just as tough and, and, uh, and have strong constitution just like uh, they're you know, the dwarves. And I've seen like different um, movies and books where someone has grown in a different society and they grew up with the traits and skills of that society or, or that culture. And there's nothing like that in D&D. Um, again, you have to kind of homebrew something like that to, if you want to um, uh, create an uh, interesting character that way, you know. Um, um, so with this, you're allowed to do so. You can, you can, you can do some really interesting customization so if you had a tiefling and a human parent you can take tiefling features such as uh their size their speed uh their physical capabilities like dark vision or resistance to fire um and cross it um with human if you're going like half tiefling of some sort but you also have cultural traits so if you grew up in a tiefling society or you built a tiefling society um uh maybe you grew up on being an intelligent and uh, charismatic person so you would get intelligence and charisma as bonus features and I like the idea of your the culture of the society you're in developing those physical skills and mental skills that you that are learnable because not everything is learnable like you can't learn to make your vision darker like you can't make yourself learn to have dark vision I don't think maybe in real life you can but in D&D, I don't think you can. Hmm. And, uh, but some things like languages, like you're obvi- like you're more likely to know Infernal if you are an elf growing up with tieflings than you are to know Elvish. Like, it, and it just, it makes a little more sense. 
I like this because to me it, it gives players um, a, a better backstory that makes sense, you know, that will fit their character better. Um, I, I like this a lot. I, 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 I'm making this book kind of the, the, the ideas of this book like a, like a permanent thing in my campaigns for my 5e campaigns from now on. So if anyone makes a new character, I'm going to use these rules instead of what uh, the 5e handbook, player's handbook has. Uh, it's yeah. just, it, it just, I don't know, just, it, it just gives a player better tools to make a, a, a much more interesting character. Because I, I get bored. I mean, I played D&D for like, what, 30 years? And it's, I feel like it's the same thing, you know, like, um, you know, oh, you're a drow. Oh, you you, you should uh, be a D for something or whatever. You, it's like the same race, same class combinations over and over again. Yeah. And because you know certain uh, traits that an elf has works probably better for a wizard or um, uh, a dwarf, you know, a fighter. You know, and why does that have to be like? I, it it should it should be it should be old D and D had this weird way of looking at. Uh, like races and class and you have to have the the right stats to be a class and and the, the right race to fit that and all this and, it, and i remember when second edition was out i was like so frustrated with that i just left to another system and i'm glad that that there's these options now so that you can make much more interesting characters um but i'm sorry I'm, <laughs> what, what? Uh, it's fine I, and it's not even just like interesting characters it's also more realistic too you know it's just like well like because you you're oh god i i always miss these things up but like just because you're a gnome doesn't mean you are intelligent more than strong but you will always have the size if you are a full-blooded gnome you might always be short so you might always be a small size person, but that doesn't mean for your size, you aren't strong. Maybe you grew up with orcs and because their society just happened to have uh, some uh, physical, like like their society was involved more physically, you grew up that way. But the nice thing there is that reading farther in, they do leave the exceptions too. So like they say, hey, maybe your society didn't grow up uh, in, um, an elf, maybe they grew, maybe you're a gnome that grew up with elves, but those elves, maybe they weren't dexterous, maybe they were um, motionless and they were just wise. So maybe like you want a plus two to uh, wisdom and plus one to intelligence instead of the, you know, the normal dex bonuses you'd get from an elf. Uh, ju just because, you know, just because you're growing up into an elven society doesn't mean that elven society fits the standards that even 5e originally had for them. Um, and what's nice is that there is a whole section. To, um, you get to hit the mixed ancestry and diverse culture section too. Uh, after yes. the basic stuff, uh, I, I love that because it basically was saying, "Hey, yeah, if you decide you want to be a tiefling and a gnome, uh, go ahead. Just you you know what their basic stats are for each. Just kind of pick in the middle of that each time, and it works for ancestry. And then for culture, it's like." we're going to just let you write your own rules for that because like, who knows where you're growing up. And I like that because, you know, if you are a, a tiefling growing up with elves who live in a woods versus elves that live in a city are still going to be extremely different. Like it's just, I don't know. I think this is, I think this is great. Um, yeah. I, I like the, uh, uh, I like that as well. I like that, uh, that, that again, you, you can make some really interesting um characters you know um a, a dragonborn with, with elvish ancestry what what's that like that's a whole new story that that needs to be told um a, a gnome that um that um has a uh, 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 dwarven blood in their veins from from their one of their ancestors um or, or human what, what's that like what's that story you know and so it's a lot of potential good things like i uh, like it's a lot of potential like 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 character building and and story building that can happen with these, with uh, with with this rule set. Now the only thing that I I don't want to say it's a, I don't want to say it's a negative, but I I I kind of wish, like I feel like at the end when you read um, uh, everything, I think it's like toward the middle when he starts explaining and ends explanation, he kind of he kind of makes up. He talks about like all right, like you can pick from multiple things but it's up to your game master 
to know when to like draw the line and, and talk to your players about that. And I think if you're a new game master, that might be tr difficult because you may not know what that line is. I think if you're, you've played enough, if you game mastered enough, um, yeah, you would know. You would know like, okay, um, maybe taking all these um, uh, 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 different traits uh, might be too much. Maybe your character's a little bit too, too powerful. Um, yep. You know, so I, I'm worried that, that dungeon masters may not know how to deal with that so quickly. That's fair. Uh, granted, it does, there, for every step along the way, there is a breakdown to what uh, they, uh, to what um, they recommend. And I do like that. So like even at the end, there's a, basically a section for personalized cultural traits. So even if you didn't want to go off of the diverse cultural stuff or the specific ones for each race, you could still uh, choose your own depending on what you're kind of basically what you're making your backstory. And I think, I think that's still a fair way to do it. Um, but I, I agree with you. Like if you're just like, huh, I'm going to get, uh, have an elf and tiefling parents and I'm just going to stack those abilities that I know overlap really, really well. Um, you might get players like that sometime, but the problem is like in any game, you're always, you may always run into characters like that. There's some people who might do it by accident, but if someone's doing it on purpose, they're going to try to pull it either way. So, <laughs> but if people are just doing it by accident, I mean, so the new player is a little stronger, just as long as everyone's having fun and they're not taking the spotlight too much from other people that, anyone cares because some people don't even want to be in the spotlight you know some people want to be that background character so you know see what people like yeah. um now what surprised me about this book um when we when i bought it surprised both of us to be honest yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this book is about 70 pages and halfway halfway in uh is two adventures that uh, the uh, the author gives you and uh, i thought that was very interesting I, again i expected just uh, just just more rules i like them in the sense that what they are trying to teach with both of them goes along with the theme of any ancestry any culture there is a potential for cooperating between all of them and a potential for understanding between all of them and i think that's pretty clearly defined in the uh designer's belief and also the in general i would say most of the D, &D community's belief at this point um, the first one, uh, Light of Unity, is pretty short. I think you could do that as a one-shot, um, but it's a fun introduction. Like, if you're making characters specifically to use these, that's a pretty, that could be a pretty fun one-shot just to get a lot of versatility to, like, learn how these uh, uh, multi-ancestral, multi-cultural characters uh, could work. The second one, neither of them are crazy unique or like, like they're not winning an award for the for the adventure so much as the uh wonderfully detailed information they have before but um i think you could do the first one as a one shot and the second one would work as like a second adventure like another like three maybe three session adventure right afterwards that like you're like did you guys enjoy this yeah okay you want to keep playing yeah oh okay so i got this for you right afterwards if you want and then we can open up um one of the um official D&D books and do like a full on adventure. Like, I think they're a good lead into things. They don't like blow my mind in any like specific way. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I felt the same way when I read these adventures. I wasn't, I wasn't um, um, like uh, blown away by them, you know, but I think I, I saw them as a guide as a, <laughs> like, all right, like, okay. So if you're interested about how these rules work in a D&D setting, um, and or examples of it, like how it's role played or how it's put together. Um, this is a, a a way to do it, and um, I think it's fine. And, and as I mentioned before, like that, I was worried that um, dungeon masters, young dungeon masters, may not have a hard time um, with balance. Like I think these are these adventures help that in some way, um, so that it at least with world building, they have a a, a good sense of how it's done. All right, guys, that's it for today. Um, again, we love this book. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it specifically. What kind of ancestry cultural mix would you like to make? Do you want like a, a gnome raised by dragonborns? Or do you think maybe you want dragonborns raised by gnomes? What would the differences be? What the similarities would be? Tell us about your crazy culture and ancestry mix down in the comments and we can see what funky things we can bring to life. 